Grambra back with some Grand Tactician Civil War. Our USA campaign on very hard, very high difficulty and aggression. Where we left off the last episode, we had just fought a defensive battle here in the vicinity of Fredericksburg. And it was actually on the Fredericksburg map where we used Maurice Heights, as it turns out, simply facing in the other direction as our defensive position. And that is the, uh, <clears throat> that's the third battle we've fought in just like a couple weeks of game time in Virginia. And I'd, I'd remarked a, a couple times earlier in this campaign about how, well, very hard, very high. I'm not really seeing much of a difference. Uh, starting to see a little bit of a difference. Is the AI really acting all that terribly differently? Maybe not. Maybe a little bit, but not, not much. But, but what I'm finding is, is that in the tactical battles, and I've mentioned this before as well, um, they're not quite as much of a pushover. <laughs> I guess I'll say that. Uh, the, the morale of their units, the, the, the loss resilience of their units seems to be, they just seem a little tougher and they'll, they'll stand and fight and duke it out for a, a, a longer period of time. And the end result is the same or similar to, to what we've seen in previous campaigns. Uh, but the casualties on our side are, are higher. And, um, you know, if we just look at the overall casualties, now we've still got a pretty comfortable gap here, all right? I'm, I'm not wanting to oversell this. Uh, the Confederacy has lost uh, 31,000 men. We've lost 12,000. So that is about a, what, uh, a two and a half to one ratio. Well, if you play on mediocre or, or, or hard, you know, this typically winds up being something more in the realm of three and a half to almost four to one is, I'm not going to say like that all the time, but with my style, the way I tend to play, that, that's kind of what I'm used to seeing. And so this casualty gap, while still very much in our favor, uh, is not quite the gap that I've seen before. So we are taking more casualties, and we are having, as a result, uh, or alongside it, we are having a little bit more of a morale problem from time to time that I'm accustomed to seeing as well. Because those casualties you know, have a symbiotic effect with state support of states which which provide these units. And the more ca you know like the more casualties you take in just say Pennsylvania units <clears throat> the lower the state support in Pennsylvania is going to be, which then feeds back into how many recruits. You know, what's the manpower pool in Pennsylvania? It's going to be a little bit smaller and smaller the lower that state support goes. And the rate at which they replenish casualties in Pennsylvania regiments will, will decrease a little bit as well. And so, you know, I'm not saying, oh my gosh, we're going to start losing battles, because, no, that, that's, that's not what I'm saying. I, I'm, but, but it's just a little bit closer, there's a little bit more management involved. Uh, anyway, I think I've made the point. It's not a huge deal, it's not a huge difference, but there is a difference. <laughs> and uh, while each battle in itself is not necessarily a desperate affair 
I'm kind of getting a sense that now that we're into this campaign season, you know, the weather's better, or will be very shortly, might be fighting some more frequent battles, right? They, they might come back off a of readiness and, and come back for another pop uh, a little bit quicker. And so an individual battle, okay, yeah, we can do the usual defensive position, let them attack into us, use cover and all that sort of stuff. In each individual battle is not going to be a problem. But then you fight four of those <laughs> over a pretty quick time period. And, uh, well, you know, you might start having some issues. Even right now. Now, we just finished this, this battle. I haven't even started advancing time yet. And so, First Corps has got a little bit of attrition problems. And, if you know, he's got over 2,300 men disabled. And a lot of those are wounded, not sick. He's got about 1,000 wounded still. But then we can see here the 6th Corps, which is which didn't see a whole lot of combat in this most recent battle, but had just then fought the battle before, uh, pretty much by itself. You know, they're down into the orange readiness now, having gone through not one but two battles in quick succession. And even though the 6th Corps did not see as much combat at Fredericksburg, He's still carrying more wounded now because of those two battles that he's gone through. So there's a little bit of recovery time that's needed here for 6th Corps. Which has actually picked up a star. <laughs> Where his 1st and 2nd Corps, have, which have been around longer, they haven't yet. Um... Anyway, I think I've said enough about that. One other thing that's been happening in these uh, battles, though, is kind of my, the, the standard organization that I like uh, over time in this game. And I've kind of settled on a nine brigade, talking about the infantry. I'm not talking about Artie and Cav, but nine infantry brigades in a corps. And, and I've you know, I talked about that in an early episode here, episode three, where I talked about uh, the organizational plan that I intended to pursue. And what, but the dynamic of these battles is that even if you have multiple cores involved, most of the time you wind up with one core doing a disproportionate share of the fighting because they're the first on the field they're the first to establish the defensive position you know the ai i mean just like the player probably wouldn't either right it's, so it's natural that the enemy's not going to wait for your reinforcements to come they're going to pitch into you or it's a situation where you want to engage even before you in, in any case one core winds up doing a lot of the fighting and a couple times here, I have felt not limited so much by the sheer numbers. It's not the manpower, but, you know, there's only so much battlefront <laughs> that seven brigades can provide. And there's less uh, flexibility in, the ter in, in terms of uh, maybe having a couple of uh, reserve brigades available to take a place in line for our routed unit or a unit that runs low on ammo. And so I've been doing pretty well, but this campaign and last campaign is the CSA with seven brigade corps. In the last couple battles, I have felt a little bit stretched. And some of our brigades have taken uh, quite a pounding in situations where there really wasn't anyone else around to kind of relieve them in line or protect their flank or things like that. So in the interest of a little bit more uh, maneuverability, uh, flexibility, 
I've decided I'm going to go ahead and, and bump all these cores up to my uh, old uh, 9 brigade structure. Which will take a little while. It's not happening immediately. But at the Army HQ in uh, D.C., I've got several brigades now recruited. They haven't arrived yet here. And then I've also got quite a few brigades now recruiting and at some point will arrive at Western Department under Halleck at Cairo. Then once they get there and come up a little bit in readiness then I'm going to farm out an extra two brigades uh, to all the existing corps. Had about 200,000 men in uniform and over a hundred thousand in the manpower pool so that's how I decided to use a lot of that available uh, volunteer manpower uh, I think a total of 15 brigades being recruited which is uh, about 45,000 men And that, in turn, probably means I may not be recruiting those independent cavalry corps that I talked about early in the campaign. Because we now have all of our militia acts complete, and we have military two complete. And uh, I talked in that early episode about how I generally try to avoid resorting to the draft or resorting to volunteer bounties. So I think that this uh, kind of little over 300,000 total uh, manpower pool is about all we got. And with about 45,000 more men transferring from the pool into the fielded forces, you know, we're talking about 250, 260,000 fielded, and perhaps 50 to 60,000 remaining in the pool. And I want to maintain a robust pool. Um, I, I do see a fair number of other. Uh, GTCW uh, gameplay posted and I see a lot of times uh, the player will pretty much zero out that available manpower in fielding forces which is perfectly fine it works <laughs> okay I'm not criticizing anybody at all uh what I like to do is I like to maintain so you know quite a bit of pool because it's not just about new units, but that's also where the replacements for existing units, attrition, battle casualties, desertion, sickness, that's that's where those replacements come from. So I like to keep it pretty robust. All right. Enough of all that stuff. Okay, so um, Army of the Potomac has been has now seen off three different Confederate armies in Virginia over the past uh, couple weeks of game time. No doubt they will be back. But what I'd like to do is extend uh, First Corps on down and take Richmond as soon as uh, he's able to do so. And while he's got a fair amount of attrition going on right now, he is green readiness. Yo, what is that icon? High officer casualties. Yeah, I think we had some KIAs and WIAs in the last uh, battle. Now when that happens, you don't have to hunt through and, and replace them. The game will replace them, but I, but it carries a morale hit apparently. Let's just double check that. Let me make sure I'm not talking out my ass there.
One other thing I did, I did not go through and make any actual command changes, but I did kind of peck through some of these brigade commanders and guys who looked like they were kind of in, you know, pretty good. I went ahead and promoted them from colonel to brigadier so that later they're already at the rank they need to be to bump up to uh, divisional command. Sheridan was one. I think I promoted Keys, who took no stat losses himself. I hadn't quite glommed on to this, but I've talked before about how you can promote an officer and they lose stats, and you don't really know what they're going to lose until after you've done it. If you hover over the promote, now it doesn't tell you stat by stat, but it does tell you you know, what the effect of promotion is going to be on their experience and fame. It's just a static number. Because, you know, you still don't know, okay, is his leadership just over the edge for two stars? Or does he have enough room where he's not going to lose his two stars? But it is going to tell you how much. And, and basically how it works out is the West Point officers lose 13% of their experience upon promotion whereas volunteers and political officers lose 25 percent and I knew that West Pointers lost less I didn't know that that was the specific number involved and Bernie's a political officer yeah, it's the same minus 25%. And everyone has a 5% bump on their fame <clears throat> when they get promoted. So that's what's been happening in Virginia and what I think is going to happen in the near future. First engineers have completed this fort, Fort Cruft. Let's find a let's find a commander for this fort. Oh, maybe I already did. Yeah, I put this uh, Wisconsin general there, which means we can find something else for First Engineering Corps to do. Now, because of West Virginia having gone Union now. And because uh, 4th Corps has come on down through here, some of these infrastructure points up here in this uh, central Appalachian High Valley have already turned Union. And others are about to flip. Knoxville itself is uh, almost captured. Let's see what Heinzelman's... He's at 45%. I think he better start building a supply depot. And that was one of our goals, right? Because as soon as Knoxville flips, it's Thomas Riggins Iron Works, which is a major weapons production center for the Confederacy, is going to flip the Union control. Now, whether that really has a demonstrable effect on the, wep the, the weapons and numbers available in the uh, Confederacy's armory whenever they upgrade weapons for their brigades? I don't know. It should. But at the very least, this, uh, you know, this weapons production piece here and artillery ammunition and small arms ammunition and, and uh, artillery itself, that should at least impact the supply 
of Confederate corps and armies on the map. Kind of wondering if I should put a fort here as well. I think I'm more interested in uh, continuing on down and taking Chattanooga as well. I think I'm going to do that. In the meantime, I kind of want to impede the Confederacy using you know, coming back and capturing some of these places back and opening up some of this line. I think I'm going to bring this engineering corps down to Salem. Building a fort right around in here. Let's do that. And I also noticed Fourth Corps does have another perk, and I'm going to give him the pontoon Brit, the pontoon train, specifically for the supply buff. McClellan is not far from picking up the perk at the Army HQ level. <clears throat> One thing worth mentioning, you got to have troops to build stuff, telegraphs, supply, and forts. Army HQs usually do not actually, you can put troops in them. Like McClellan could run around with his own little infantry brigade. You simply just don't put it in a corps. Like, you know, it, I can I can use add new unit under McClellan, and uh, well, I just do it just to show. You know, so he so you know you can have a little unit cav artillery, whatever, directly under the army commander, not in a subordinate corps. And this unit will just travel around with him. You can, you know, so you can do that. Um, I don't, typically. Matter of fact, I'm going to delete that unit. But even though there's no actual troops with the army HQ, McClellan still has all these troops under his command. And the way it kind of works is, you know, not within the uh, combat radius of the core, but McClellan can build something up here, too. As a matter of fact, These guys aren't in telegraph command. We kind of need a telegraph station here at Knoxville. I don't see one already built. So just to demonstrate this little bitty kind of obscure mechanic. Okay, he can't build it. That's not because he doesn't have troops, though. I think that's because there's nothing for that telegraph station to connect to. See, he can build a supply depot. I could pop a supply depot right here. In McClellan's combat radius, not within the Corps' combat radius. So you can actually use your... Army HQ units, even if they don't have troops in them, is kind of a little engineering core in and of itself. Following along, you know, building stuff in the area of where the army is operating that may not be right by one of the cores. And speaking of, let me turn on the telegraph and... 
Yeah. Okay. Yeah, we need to get some telegraph action going on here in eastern Kentucky, eastern Tennessee. Huh. I should have thought of that as I was moving these guys down. Need a telegraph station back up here somewhere. Somewhere like halfway between Lexington and London would do. I didn't think of that as he was moving down. Um, well, I'm just going to do this. I was just talking about it. Let's just have uh, the Army HQ run back up here. <laughs> it won't take them all that long to do that. And then once that station is built, then we should be able to build a telegraph at Knoxville. <clears throat> Over here on the, on the rivers, we have taken Fort Hyman, and these monitors are beating up on Fort Henry. The bombardment won't actually start until I start time running again. But uh, Fort Henry's condition has been beat down a little bit. We have lost some river monitors in the process. But that should make it easier for this engineering corps to quickly take Fort Henry. Polk's command has wintered over at Clarksville and has not yet started the move. All right, let's get some time rolling here. There's the bombardment starting up. Okay, Beauregard is retreating back this way. Yeah, to Charlottesville, and he's building a... Well, there's already a supply depot being built over here. So one of the two other Confederate armies has... is sitting here as well. We just can't see him. I don't think there's anything in Hancock's way. Let's go take Richmond. Who's going to stop me? Let's make sure that the Army HQ Okay, yeah, still within his command radius Move him down just a little bit though. We'll move him down to Fredericksburg Idle 6 Corps is doing fine for supply. Hancock is doing fine for supply. And it's not just the capital, it's also these two big uh, industrial plants. Okay, yeah. Confederacy doesn't like that. Someone's coming back up the railroad. Army of the Northwest on its way. Here he comes. Only estimated to be 13,000 men. Speaking of weapons, T-34 
two battles ago up at uh, Manassas Junction, one of Lytle's divisions saw some very heavy combat. It, one of them actually broke and routed, and the other one came very close. And it wasn't really that unit's fault. There we go. Richmond Falls, capital taken. Southerners in shock. Okay, Confederacy goes free trade with their uh, policy choice, which increases their support, helps out their cotton. Okay, what the Confederacy has not done yet is they haven't chosen military too, and I'm not sure. I don't think they've gone with uh, the three-year militia act. I could be wrong about that. But I, but I know they haven't done military too. So they don't quite have the uh, volunteer manpower available yet that we do. And the other thing is, as long as they don't go military too, they also cannot resort to conscription. But I think the Army of the Northwest is about to come contest. This recent development, and that's fine. Come on down. Let's see how our naval bombardment is doing over here on Fort Henry. I think it's Henry. Nope, oh, we got another perk. Let's go with limelights. Combat efficiency in the dark plus twenty five percent, which the bombardment goes twenty four hours, so this thing is in effect half the time. Go with that. He is starting to, he's, he is losing readiness as this fight goes on. He's down just into the yellow. All of his ships are in pretty good shape, but as we have seen, they're also prone to just blowing up out of the blue. <laughs> We've lost two monitors, monitors that way. Okay. Well, keep pounding there, Farragut. I got more monitors building to replace these. We'll let him do what he's going to do and then we'll waltz in with uh, the second engineers to take this fort. First engineers are in place now to build the desired fort outside Salem. Maybe. That'll do. How's his supply? He's doing fine. He doesn't need to build a supply depot. And with his perk, he's already got a 25% head start on that construction. Okay, so Army of the Northwest changed their mind. They got over here and like, nope. <laughs> Rear guard pursuit. Kind of tempted now to pop down and take Petersburg too. That, eh, that smells like that could wind up being trouble. How is our Atlantic Army doing? Okay, they're up to 
Orange Readiness, 8th Corps. I think he's got all of the men now. Yeah. Okay. As I've talked about before, the plan for... Okay, more Mexico stuff. Generally historical flavor, but this little historical narrative, storyline, is tied to one of the Confederate policies, which is supporting the French intervention in Mexico. And to be honest, I hope that the AI CSA does not do that. And I don't think I've seen them do that before, but I hope they do not because I have seen, I've never seen it, I've never had it happen to me because I wouldn't take that policy, but that policy appears bugged. The effect of the CSA Mexico policy is supposed to be that, I forget what the specific, but it increases the chance of French intervention in the Civil War, and you wind up getting a French army that comes up uh, and starts causing problems for the Union uh, out west. So that's the benefit of why to go for that policy. But the downside is the CSA supports that intervention by helping with some units in Mexico, which is off map. So for gameplay purposes, it, it is supposed to result in a 50% reduction in Texas state volunteers. And that's what's supposed to happen. What actually happens is there appears to be a much, much larger drain on Confederate manpower across the board. Uh, to the point where I've seen players who have... You know, they're sitting in 1862, early 1863, with no troops at all in their volunteer manpower. And it wasn't because they over-recruited. It just, every state just zeroes out and stays zero. So there appears, and, and I've seen it in two different campaigns with different players, so that policy seems to be bugged. Maybe it only affects uh, a player. Maybe the AI wouldn't have that problem. Or maybe it would affect him. So anyway, I just hope AI CSA doesn't take that and screw itself. <laughs> With the plan for this army, as I think I've talked about before, is there's a port up here. So they're going to go seaborne when they're ready and come down here and take Fort Norfolk and take the city of Norfolk. Maybe before I send him further south, maybe he can come up and occupy Petersburg for us. I mean, there's still another Confederate army bopping around somewhere over here, unseen. And I kind of feel like as soon as I move Second Corps away from Winchester and bring him further south to support the 1st and the 6th, that army's going to, oh, okay, come back up and go after Winchester again. <laughs> Is Polk moving? Nope. He is out of winter quarters, though. Yeah, because it's April. Okay, Fort Henry is down to 36% condition. 14 men remaining in the... Nope, and he's picked up another... Picked up another perk. Let's, let's go for the amphibious attack, maybe. It's a small chance. It's not guaranteed, but with that perk, there's a small chance that the naval force might actually capture the fort on its own. I've never seen it happen, 
<laughs> but supposedly that chance is there. Fourth core on. Oh, yeah, we need to get the telegraph going. There we go. Let's see if we can get it down on this side of his build radius closer to Knoxville. I think that'll be close enough. And he'll get a little bit of uh, XP from that, too, for his perk slot, which will be Ambulance Corps. That's always the one I like to go with for the Army HQ's first perk slot. And Knoxville is captured. Once this... Uh, by the way, between Richmond and Knoxville, how are we doing here? 46 national morale for the Confederacy. Okay, I'm going to ease 6 core a little bit further south. Just so his reinforcement speed will be a little bit quicker if and when 1st Corps gets engaged at Richmond. Army HQ at DC, orange readiness. That would indicate that... Uh, all of those uh, additional brigades have now arrived and are training up. Six Corps has now opened a perk slot. Go with the default flying column for the first one. <clears throat> and I think I forgot about, I think I've got a uh, Yeah, I, I, this guy's been sitting out here for quite a while. He needs to come down to here. He's intended to go over and blockade Pensacola. That's walk. So I need to watch for that message and clear the clear the log here. Withdrawing. Oh, that's the Army of the Northwest that was withdrawing. Place. Okay, Farragut, how you doing? Twelve, six men remaining. Eleven percent condition on the fort. I'm just curious to see if he can actually pick up ownership of that fort. <laughs> I don't think he will, to be honest. Farragut. good. 
I don't see any reason why Grant can't just come up here and smack Polk. It might actually make him retreat. And he's he's kind of surrounded right now. He doesn't he's not connected to the rest of the Confederacy. Which means the closest spot he could retreat to is I think Jackson. And if he goes there, the Mississippi Army can come up and pop him. Sixth Corps back up to Green Readiness in Virginia. I'm going to have First Corps build some forts at, uh, at Richmond, one guarding the west, one guarding the east. Okay, 4th Corps has a supply depot. Oh, okay. So it looks like this telegraph station is close enough. Let's go ahead and get... So we can get this uh, telegraph station building now at Knoxville. I think. Maybe? Maybe not. That might just be it doesn't find a nice open spot to put it. Bah. Maybe we have to bring Let's bring McClellan's HQ back down to here. Sure seems like he ought to be able to build one. I just don't think there's enough open ground. I don't think it's a connection issue. Could be wrong. I think the Navy should be done with that fort by now. It is zero. Okay. All right, Farragut, go uh, go repair somewhere. <laughs> Return to port. Off you go. Second engineers. Uh, no, I don't want that because I don't want him. I want to bring the seventh corps down, not to take Fort Henry. Okay, we got our confiscation act, which basically means that we can confiscate stuff in Confederate states. Which, which improves our supply situation. And 
also that includes a particular form of property about which uh, is the central issue of this war. So what to do next? I'm kind of thinking industrialization three is a strong candidate. Breadbasket two is a strong candidate. Government funding two is a strong candidate. I'm not looking to do a whole bunch more recruiting real soon. I think I can hold off on this since I'm at triple B. Basically, as your credit rating decreases, you get to a point where the government doesn't have sufficient credit for new expenditures, which means you cannot recruit any troops. But that credit rating, I believe, is either at B, single B, or it might be B minus. We still have several levels of credit rating to go before that gets dire. I think I'm going to go Industry 3, which will increase our Industry um, and transportation subsidy, which should help with weapon production and supply infrastructure. Now, on the weapons production, I don't, I don't need that for rifles anymore. But I do need it for artillery. I don't have very many rifles in the uh, armies. Rifled artillery, that is. There's some in the Army of the Potomac. None of the other armies have any at all. And even the Army of the Potomac doesn't have quite enough. So I'm going to go with that, which means I need to bump up my politics subsidy a little bit to open up a policy slot. And that's going to take almost two months, 54 days. But I want the, now I don't care if 2nd Engineering Corps takes Fort Henry. I want to move them close enough and maybe that'll happen. But I don't want this force taking Fort Donaldson. I want 7th Corps doing that because that will then count for 7th Corps' first combat. And he won't. Uh, those the units in this corps will not have that uh, nerf, morale nerf, when they go into the tactical map for the first time. In any case, we've been going uh, not quite an hour here, and I think that's going to do it for this episode. I know there wasn't a whole ton of action. But, we've taken Richmond. That's a pretty big deal. <laughs> we've taken Knoxville, Tennessee. That's a pretty big deal. Uh, and so, it, in this episode, not only have we taken those two important cities, one of which is the capital, which is a huge morale hit for the Confederacy, but we've also uh, taken control of the three biggest weapons production facilities in the Confederacy. Uh, the Richmond Armory, the Tredegar Ironworks, and the Riggins factory at Knoxville. So that's got to have a huge effect on Confederacy supply infrastructure for those important uh, items. As a matter of fact, now that we've taken those and they're reflected as Union, let's look at Ironworks for the Confederacy. We 
which they have a lot more than those. But these newer ones that they've built and some of the pre-existing ones, they have very low production rates. If we looked at... Uh, it's going to take a while to find them in here, but... Uh, So the Thomas Riggins here was doing, now it's lower now because I guess because we've taken it maybe, but the, the production of these important items was much higher under Confederate control, like around in the 11s and 12s for these things, uh, steel, weapons, ammunition. And the Richmond Armory and the Tredegar Iron Works were also much higher than they are now. And even at this level, the reduced production under new management, even at this level, they're still much higher than any of the iron works that the Confederacy still has. You know, see a lot of 0 0.1, 0 0.3, 0 0.5s. Looks like the biggest uh, weapons production plant they have now. They got a couple, well, well so this one's pretty big, 2.6. It's not like those three were before, but this is the biggest one they have now. That, it, however, is down in... Uh... Oh no, that's the one at Nashville. The one that is, we own Nashville, but that particular plant is still Confederate because of how close Polk is. Yeah, okay. I should have, I should have gone up there and attacked him a little bit earlier. <laughs> like a month or a month and a half ago. Which I think is what we are going to do in the next episode. You know, I have a certain style with my content. It kind of meanders a little bit and I talk a lot. Time compression tends to be a little slower than what one often sees in YouTube land. But if you like this sort of stuff and uh, you know you like kind of the way I jabber on of analyzing, if you like it leave a like, leave a comment, uh, maybe even a subscribe. But in any case, uh, thank you very very much for watching. And uh, in our next episode, I think we're going to go pop uh, Polk. See you then.